Tony Blazevich, welcome to the Pace Performance Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure to be here, finally. <laughs> no, thank you very much. It's uh, I've been pestering you for a long time. I feel like I've been pestering you for a long time, which is, which is no yeah. problem at all, but I'm glad you're a busy man. So it's, um, it's, it's fantastic to get you on. I'm really excited to discuss some of the topics that we're going we're gonna to get through. But just before we do, Tony, would you mind just giving us a bit of a, a background on you? If, in case people don't know who sure. you are. Uh, yeah, of course, every most people. I, I'm a professor of biomechanics, so I basically study how humans move, and particularly for me at the tissue level. So what are muscles doing? What are tendons doing? And these days, more, more and more, What's the nervous system doing to help us move? And how does exercise training help us build the optimum human with the right nervous system, the right muscles and the right tendons to move? Um, I've worked uh, both in academia as well as in um, uh, clinic and sport. I also, by the way, uh, have to lecture in clinical neurophysiology. So I have to have that sort of um, uh, medical side, I guess, to, to what I do. But my, my real passion, passions are working in sport and helping coaches, athletes, and scientists to try and optimize human performance. So it's in, term, in, in terms of your role, are people tapping into you from professional sports, either locally or further afield? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, in, in this day and age now, we've got the technology where someone doesn't have to necessarily you know, invite me from Perth, which is sort of you know, a long way away from anywhere, one of the most isolated capital cities in the world. Um, so we do nowadays a, a lot of um, video um, uh, chats. Of course, you know, clubs, strength and conditioners, coaches might send me videos of athletes moving or game scenarios and then ask what, 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 what I see, technically what they're doing, how S&C might inform that. And so we can do a lot of personal development and, and, and that sort of stuff nowadays with uh, the technologies we have. In terms of biomechanics, and one of the verticals, I suppose, that, that normally encompasses a, a sports science degree, for example, is biomechanics the most scary for an S&C coach? <laughs> well, I, think it I mean, is, it depends on your background, but I'd say, <laughs> yeah, I'd say yes. I, I, but but here's, here's the thing. I mean, biomechanics is normally, first up, also not the favorite of any sports science student. Um, and what I would say is I nearly failed maths in high school. Um, I really struggled with maths. Physics is a whole different kettle of fish. I loved physics because it made sense. Maths was very abstract. And so I think with biomechanics, if you're, if you're taught by someone who really focuses on techniques, technology, and the mathematical underpinnings, then it, it's going to scare a lot of people who don't have happy experiences in that realm. But to me, I mean, I always thought when I was a sports science student that I'd end up as a physiologist because after all, isn't that what they all are? But actually, as I got further into my degree, I realized that if, if I don't know the, the movement patterns that are required, if I don't know the forces we have to develop, if I don't know the ranges of motion I have to move through, and if I don't know the speeds that I need someone to work uh, to, to move at, then how can I possibly set any kind of useful training program? And so I end up having to move further and further into the biomechanics. And by the time I got to my PhD, my questions were simply, how do we give an optimum strength training program to a sprint runner and I'd already figured out that maybe just imitating or trying to imitate velocity was not really a key that there are lots of adaptations as we train at very different velocities but maybe there's something about the movement pattern that we need to, to replicate and I really in my early career got into this idea of understanding how much we need to replicate a movement pattern or whether just with lots of sports training, we can just give some basic lifts. And of course, the answer is very, very complicated. And uh, the more I learned, the more I realized I never knew at the time, but that meant that I really had to focus on biomechanics. And ever since then, comparing how humans move to birds and cheetah and uh, monkeys or primates, other primates, that kind of biomechanics really informed me. And that was when I was over with you guys in the UK. You know, there were people at UCL and King's College and that who were really on the animal side. And it really opened my eyes to understanding how any organism can actually complete a task. And once we just break everything back and say, what organism have I got? What is their goal? And what would be an optimum solution to this movement problem? Then we start to be able to develop plans. And, and it, to be honest, it's just the most enjoyable part of sports sciences if we just stick to sport today um, is trying to understand a human from that level um, so yeah I, I would say it, it, get into your biomechanics as much as you possibly can 
It's interesting because we had Damien Harper present at the the Speed Sportsman Speed Conference uh, two months ago, and he presented one of the videos. I think it was from UCL, and it was a cheetah accelerating and decelerating and presented that as part of his so yeah mm. very much uh on topic mentioning that so yeah fascinating fascinating stuff one thing i want to start yeah, with perfect. tony and i think it's probably the it's probably the thing that as the time with an athlete especially on the on the field that an snc coach has relative carte blanche over and that's the warm-up whether you get 20 minutes mm-hmm. whether you get half an hour whether you get 10 minutes it's the time where the S&C coach can have some sort of influence and a regular influence. So let's take it back. Let's pair the, the warm up back, not to go into kind of undergrad sports science, but why do we do a warm up in the first place? And then we'll get into the intricacies of different, pa- different phases of the warm up, I suppose, uh, in a second. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, there are a large number of reasons we do the warm up, and, and you've kind of hit on this idea that. If you're the S&C expert, you may only, in sports like football, I know it's very common that, that the warm-up is sort of that one place where they say, right, you're that person, you go and lead it, and, and everything else is really up to the coach. In other sports, of course, you know, rugby, for example, collision sports, uh, the S&C coaches usually have a lot more input, in, including even the technical aspects of, you know, how to hit rucks and malls and, and all this kind of stuff. But if we do accept that warm-up is all you've got, I mean, ultimately, the warm-up is there to get the body ready for optimum performance from a physiological perspective. So that's everything from changing muscle temperature. Remember that around about a one degree increase in muscle temperature can increase the power output by about 5%. So it's quite a significant effect having a higher muscle temperature. We've got increasing blood flow and getting the aerobic energy system really kicking along to reduce that, that oxygen debt when we need to then do high intensity exercise. We've got increases in muscle water, which I think a lot of us forget, and and maybe we're not still sure of exactly what the overall benefit is. But if you've got to read studies from the 60s and 70s, you'll be very convinced that as the muscle draws a bit of water, mostly dragged in by lactate ions or molecules, um, that muscle water increases muscle force production, and it it improves it across the velocity spectrum. So we think that might have a a big effect, and and that's in a that's sort of in addition to the neurological and the neurological is of course if you're talking about an SNC only having a certain amount of time and trying to figure out how to make the most of it I think what most of us talk about is well how can I use that as a way to ingrain optimum movement patterns how can I use that as a learning opportunity because I'm doing a warm-up in every training session and before every game instead of just literally warming them up how can I get more bang for buck and that's where a lot of your your listeners will, will think about using drills or skills to optimize movement patterns, putting in um, situation-specific um, s- uh, skills and drills that allow players to learn to pick out and notice um, patterns of play, which the more you see them, the more you start to get them naturally. That can be done in training. Uh, understanding how they can regulate their psychology for, for optimum levels of arousal. That can be done during the warm-up so that they can then continue to monitor that throughout whatever their competition game or match is and so there are lots and lots of things you can achieve in a warm-up if you know how to then put the pieces together so one thing that always comes up i'm I'm positive that i saw it the other day is the reference just going back to the animals and it may come back to the same universities you never see a cheetah stretching and Get a, get a do mobility before they before they go on sprint and catch prey or whatever it is. That's obviously a, a, a far fetched um, comparison. But where does that actually come from? Is it is there anything there whatsoever? You, yeah, I mean, for a start with the cats. I mean, cats do stretch, by the way, um, but yeah. they don't do it just before they hunt. Maybe. Um, they usually have been stalking and moving before they hunt, so they are moving. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the question there, as we could always ask, is, well, what if the cheetah could warm up? Would they have been more successful? And, and the answer is we don't really know until we do the experiments, right? But but if your question is, then seriously, why is it that humans feel the need to do these sort of long, protracted warm-ups when every other animal on Earth you know, goes about their daily existence without having to do the warm-up? And, and all I would say is that it seems like, at least in humans, and this is the same for most mammals though, is that when we're sitting at rest, our body is not in an optimum state for movement. 
if you're about to be chased by uh, an, an another animal, we Im immediately increase body temperature, we increase sympathetic drive, we increase blood flow, we take all the blood from our internal. But when we are about to play a game of netball or basketball or run 100 meters, we don't necessarily have that absolute life and death physiological response. And so we then have to imitate it. And once we try to imitate that to some degree, we then start to say, well, what else can we bolt on that would make us absolutely optimum? Because in the end, we're, to, you know, we're trying to win a game by one point or one goal or one one hundredth of a second. And so then we start to say, well, what else can we do? And this is where the warm up starts to get longer and more complicated is when we're really trying to fully optimize human performance. I, I don't think we need to do that for every weekend warrior or you know everyone who just wants to exercise i think these sort of proper highly developed warm-ups are really optimum for competitive athletes who are trying to do something pretty extraordinary i'm glad you mentioned the weekend warrior because one thing and one section of the warm-up that i'm fascinated by for, for, for a number of different reasons is this term activation or pre-activation is the seems to be the term that is used especially in professional football mm. This section of a warm up, often in the gym before the guys or girls go out on the pitch, that is designed around uh, more often than not, and this obviously differs across situations, but bands, um, various different ground based movements, and we had a we had an article on on uh, on Sportsmith around this, almost like debunking the the reasons why someone may go through this. But what fascinates me is that it's made its way, this term activation or pre-activation, into fitness magazines. And I'm sure people go to the gym and before they do a squat session, they'll be they'll see random as doing glute band work. And I think it's that transition is fascinating how it kind of catches on. But do we need to do activation before a a train session for rugby or a train session for football? What is the what is the purpose? What do people think is the purpose? Okay, well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm probably going to have to give a slightly complicated answer here. Just just to allay people's fears, um, it, it is not the case that if I just get a glute band and do some side shuffles and then 15 minutes later go and warm up fully for my sport and perform in the sport that there is likely to be some sort of major and significant effect on performance. That's probably not the case. But let me just try to allay everyone's fears across the whole spectrum here. First of all, when I watch a lot of athletes warm up, we see this a lot in football, soccer, um, although, you know, FIFA have tried to come out with their optimum warm up and still people don't do it. I, I like the optimum warm up idea because it's what we were all taught as undergrads about 30 years ago to do. But, but because a lot of athletes don't necessarily drop their center of gravity and do side shuffles and movements, they're not necessarily specifically practicing decelerations and changes of direction in warm up. They just sort of, a lot of athletes are just, you know, doing their footy skills, footy drills and playing and doing a few run throughs. It could be the case that some, some motor pattern opportunity is being gained by just practicing a very discrete skill first. And that maybe loading it by adding a band just presents more feedback to the central nervous system to know where the body is in space. The idea that it, it's somehow then allowing us to activate the agonist muscle to some degree to get more force, I'm not sure it's true, and I can go into much more detail as to why, but, but the idea that the brain needs to get calibration as to where its movements are in 3D space could be a reason why those sorts of sort of brief, short um, ac activation sequences might make people feel like they're doing something well. I would argue that if you actually did a very sport specific skill specific warm up we would see that those initial activations are not doing anything at all. But I just want to remind people though that that it is the case that you know you, you might hear particularly in the phys physiotherapy fraternity that these activation exercises are maybe more common than in the sports science fraternity and and you wonder why and you think well maybe it's because we're trained considerably in exercise whereas they have to be able to diagnose so they get less time to actually learn about exercise but at the same time remember physios are there with a lot of people who have pain a lot of people have been injured for a prolonged period of time and we can talk about this it absolutely affects your motor pattern and the way the brain communicates through the spinal cord to the muscles and so in athletes who who are struggling to adopt an optimum motor pattern it is true 
that if we spend a very small amount of time deliberately trying to activate a muscle or muscle group at a certain length or at a certain joint angle, and we slowly increase the amount of force we produce in that joint angle, that over the next minutes or even hours, that specific motor pathway will be um, highly excited. That will be a pathway that is easier to send signals through. The possibility then exists in those athletes that when they then start to do the warm up, they're actually feeling like they're able to hit the appropriate technique better. Again, I'm not saying that that means that they can all of a sudden activate the muscles so remarkably well. What I'm saying is that long term potentiation, by long term, we're talking seconds, minutes, maybe hours, long term potentiation of a neural pathway literally is a way to allow our brain to activate a very specific action or muscle with less central or descending drive. So I just want to say that whilst I would normally not think that what we tend to see as activation exercises are going to have a significant impact on the majority of athletes, I just want people to take that step back and and accept that potentially in some people, there is a reason to do it and it might then help them further down the track through the warm up and into a game or a match. So we're talking about people that are potentially coming back from a, an injury here and then going into a warm Well, that's one example. Activity. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's one example. So so let's say you had an injury where it's still the case that at a very long muscle length, we know that you're still not quite activating properly or we know that when you're running, instead of the knee flexing nicely as it hits the ground, it's, it's remaining slightly too straight. And that's then going to put a little bit of extra pressure on the calf muscle. And that's going to then cause an increase in risk of calf injury, right? Because you've got to get power. So if the calf is now being asked to do more, we get a calf injury when the knee is not um, being used in the appropriate way. So let's just take a crazy example where someone deliberately does some one-legged sort of half squats with their eyes closed to remind themselves of how to keep the knee flexed. They then move into a, um, um, a bit of a bounce movement where they're reminding themselves to flex. And then they might move into a running drill or a running thing where they, they are they have a focus on making sure that the ground leg is hitting in the right configuration. And they may even have a coach or someone just making sure that that's the case. Once they've then practiced that motor pathway consistently for a period of time, the likelihood is that when I then throw down my running motor pattern, that specific action is more likely to occur than if I hadn't done it. And especially as I fatigue, that becomes more important. So under that condition, potentially, Performance might be slightly greater because the knee is now functioning properly. Potentially injury risk is reduced because now the ankle power doesn't have to overcome the loss of knee power. And therefore, there is a chance that that, I mean, it's not, I know it's not the, 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 the band on the glute idea, but it's what I'm saying here is that if there's a specific preconditioning drill that you're doing to remind your nervous system of how to behave, it may have a benefit further down the track. So it's based on that example and how you've wonderfully explained it, it sounds like the intention and the, I suppose, education around that is super important versus a demonstration yeah. and, okay, girls, okay, guys, off we go. It sounds like there's, there's more to it than that. There's more thought, there's more intention, there's more purpose to potentially get that benefit. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And, and 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 when we were talking about what we wanted to talk about today, that was a recurring theme that kept coming back. When you say, should we do A or B? I go, oh, <laughs> could be A, could be B. The, the point is, is that if we just do what everyone else does because they've noticed a benefit or they just believe there was a benefit, chances are we're using something that's either not going to be beneficial or may even be problematic, counterproductive. But if you've got a specific issue and you're looking for a specific solution and you understand the human system well enough, then you might find that the solution to that problem looks like one of these things that we think for the majority of people is useless. And you'd be right, for the majority of people it probably is. But if you know what you're doing, maybe it is useful. And and I think that's where the problem comes. It's it's that 
it's getting that information and knowing how to use it and when to use it. And and remember, you know, sports science is a, is a young game in many ways, you know. And so a lot of the knowledge then drifts off and we're not replacing that knowledge or mentoring people as they come through. I, I certainly didn't understand the nervous system like this when I was 25 and 30 and working with, you know, Olympic athletes in the UK. You know, it's it's it, it really is the case that understanding when and how to use things is more important than, is it good or is it bad? I mean, as you probably remember, most of my research is on muscle stretching and the amount of crazy stuff about stretching just blows me away. And you can pretty much be sure that if you believe absolutely A or absolutely B, you're wrong, right? Because the answer is somewhere in the middle and you have to truly understand the system to be able to use stretching appropriately. Last question activation. And this may be an obvious one, but it also may not. Why do the glutes get such an emphasis on this because i've been places and people call it glue activation like it's just it's just been integrated within the the term within the session so why why focus there and is i know this is a horrible question but is that focus necessary or are we just saying the same as before where the majority of the people it's probably not (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give you my answer and then I'm going to give you that little caveat again, right? In the majority of people, doing a glute activation exercise is not going to affect the way they then perform a very complicated high velocity task. Okay, so for the majority of people, I've seen no evidence that lying on your back, one leg with your knee very flexed, which just takes your hamstrings off stretch, and trying to activate the glute then affects the way the body works. And I know that there are one or two studies maybe concluding that there is but when i delve into the actual data i either don't see that it backs up the conclusion or in fact i would have taken the opposite conclusion that this actually is indicating that the nervous system is not using it right so the question then is why is everyone focusing on the glute well for a start if we're talking about running based athletes it is true that when the hip is relatively flexed and then generates an extensive moment The gluteal muscles are very, very important. In that case, gluteus maximus is a really important hip extensor along with the the hamstrings. Once the foot is on the ground, you have other gluteal muscles that are really important, minimus, medius, as well as tensor fascia lata and a few of your, I'll call them just hip rotator muscles, a bit like your rotator cuff. You've got like a rotator cuff around the hip and they are trying to hold the pelvis in the optimum position to allow the hip as the leg swings to store and release elastic energy. And if the hip is falling, that's energy that we're using to cause rotation. And that's not energy going into forward propulsion. If the hips are moving like this, then when the hip, the thigh moves back, the muscles that are storing elastic energy are not the ones that are then trying to drive the hip flexion once the hip then comes back and corrects itself. So what we need is for the axial skeleton and the pelvis to be held in very specific body positions we need a very complicated activation pattern to do it and a lot of the muscles that help to do it either to extend the hip in the first place or to hold the pelvis are gluteal muscles not just gluteus maximus and in my experience i have to admit and particularly working in football or in soccer where you see big flat bums very uh, in in some athletes the amount of hip rotation being caused is significant. And when we've then spent sort of eight weeks um, doing exercises, both the running drills and strength work to get the hip extensors working more effectively, the glutes firing, if you like, their running mechanics fix up and their injuries are, are, are moving away and they're running faster. So I know we don't like to say, oh, I want to activate my glute better. And then people say, well, if I couldn't activate my glute, I couldn't walk. And I would say, well, I can do a push up, but I can't bench press 200 kilos. At the elite level, it could be the case that working a certain motor pathway is very, very useful. And because a lot of us are running athletes, the glute probably cops a lot of that that stuff. But look, at the end of the day, the predominant power output is actually coming from your ankle uh, when you run, not from your hip. Your hip obviously does the work that is stored at the ankle, so it's still absolutely vital. But in lots of other sports and lots of other movement directions, there are many other muscles that need to be activating appropriately for optimum performance. So I'm not sure why glute is always specifically targeted, but at the same time, I just wanna put in that caveat that in a lot of athletes who aren't highly trained sprint runners and are doing sports where they're often performing under fatigue and start to get into bad motor pattern habits, 
that working on how the hip extensors function can be very, very useful for those athletes. Okay, perfect. So good, so good. <laughs> so if so if if I'm a SNC coach and I'm working in a professional club and I've sold to the coaches that I need an extra 10 minutes per day, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for an activation session and it needs to mimic what I've potentially been doing over the last six months because otherwise there may be, oh, why have you changed it? Did you not? Did it not work what you were doing before? If it's got to be an activation session, let's put that umbrella up there. <laughs> what would you recommend that looks like for a group? Do we continue mm-hmm. down the glute, glute activation? Because that could potentially, based on your previous comments like it could be beneficial (laughs) or do we go bin it let's do let's increase that warm-up time to actually prepare for the work that we're going to do okay so this is where sorry yeah look that's all right in my opinion now that's an unanswerable question in the sense that what what you would have to be doing is you would have to understand how your players are moving You'd have to be thinking about what you believe their current weaknesses are and that if you could improve the way they move that would reduce injury or improve performance, what would they be? Now, first of all, it's going to be different for every individual. So you're going to have to prescribe it individually. But let's pretend that most of your athletes are are running in a certain way. Well, the thing is, is that what I would ask is whether doing some side shuffle glute band stuff is actually going to then optimize the technique you're trying to improve whether that's running running acceleration change of direction swerving whatever it is or is it for example that if your rugby player is not getting low enough to engage in a ruck should you be imitating something like that with walkover lunges or um, you know bear crawls on the ground to improve the mobility through the hip If you've got an athlete that is struggling to decelerate, you might want to then just give a couple of opportunities to decelerate. A lot of athletes have a problem decelerating and then changing direction and re-accelerating. And so the idea of actually giving them a specific task might be better. And if you want to really power it back, again, to replicating glute activation, you know, things like one-legged walkover lunges so that we can, can practice how the hip is going to extend from that you know flexed position where we're you know relatively weak you can do those kinds of i guess activation exercises to remind the brain of where the pelvis is in space where the hip is and to remind the brain to make sure that you're using glutes hamstrings and everything to actually extend at the hip so that you know every coach is probably aware that if you want to optimize a complex task, it can help to break the task down into smaller chunks, allow an understanding of those chunks, and then build it back up. And I would argue that as the SNC coach, you've got the opportunity to do exactly that. And if it looks like a glute band exercise because you've decided it, whatever, that's not for me to judge. If it looks like a walkover lunge or it looks like a sprint running drill or it looks like whatever, that's up to you. But breaking down a task and then building it up is not a bad way to spend 10 minutes of a warm-up. Thank you for humoring me there, Tony. Thank you. It's, I, pre- I appreciate it. <laughs> Such good answers. I, I just I just know that the coaches out there going, so Tony, do I or not? And I know it's not as simple as that, but thank you for thank you for that. I really appreciate it. So one other topic that I think, I don't know if it's calmed down a little bit, but because of the work of various different people including here in the UK, around asymmetries. So I mm-hmm. want to touch on that as well. And I'm not saying we're trying to debunk anything, or, but I think we're just, I'm just wanting to focus on topics that kind of get this hype and then maybe just fall back into the middle and we kind of understand a little bit more. So when it comes to asymmetries in a healthy or relatively healthy athlete, how important or how instrumental are asymmetries in how the athlete moves and should we be concerned should those asymmetries occur in a relatively healthy athlete okay um yep yeah, sorry the answer is depends so i mean if you take uh rafael nadal who clearly has a massive asymmetry is anyone going to think that his you know wrist on one side is so much stronger than the other is that a problem no it's not therefore there's a great example of where asymmetry is not an issue um, 
I, I guess what I what I I don't mind people looking for asymmetries, and usually when we look for an asymmetry, it's usually a force production asymmetry or a fatigue asymmetry. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, a physiotherapist for many many years working in elite sport, always said, if I get people to do calf raises on both sides, if they have a roundabout you know, a, a 20% difference between sides, I can almost guarantee sometime this season they'll get injured. So I think, okay, well, that's fantastic to know. Is that just because, for example, one calf is weaker or less, is more fatigable than the other? Is that what's truly causing the injury? Or is it that this is simply a proxy? It's reflective. It's, it's correlated, but not causative. And that's where I come back to the, what are we really looking at? When I say depends, I go, I don't know if that asymmetry is problematic unless I know the root cause of the asymmetry. So for example, let's go back to that idea before that when a sprinter hits the ground, if the knee is very slightly flexed, there is a cushioning effect at the knee, a little bit of storage of elastic energy, fine, but remember the knee is more about vertical propulsion than horizontal propulsion. If on the other side though, the knee is landing more uh, extended, that means to get the vertical propulsion, the brain will shift some power production down to the calf. And I keep bringing this back because I've seen it in sprinters and we've had distance runners who have chronic calf injury. And once we realized that by about 30 minutes into their run, they started to use the, the leg, the knee joint, more of a strut rather than a shock absorber, that was the leg they got injured on and you could pretty much predict their injury. So if we were just looking at their force record, we might see that one leg is producing less horizontal power and a bit more vertical than the other. And we've just published a study where we found exactly that in soccer players. The question is, is that a problem in the force record? Well, I would say that if that's just because one leg happens to be a little bit stronger than another, I'm, I'm not concerned. And I'm not going to go into the, the, the gym and try to get one leg looking like the other. What I really want to do is optimize everything. So I'll accept that everything looks great. They're not getting injured. And let's just improve everything the way I can genetically improve it. We all have a dominant side. But if I then say, go, well, we've got this imbalance here according to the force record, and it seems to be exacerbated as they fatigue, I then want to say, well, where's it coming from? And if we use just a simple 2D video, and we can see that over time their knee is flexing less and less on one side, I don't need maybe a 3D motion analysis with inverse dynamics to see that the ankle is now going to be working harder and harder. And if that athlete is prone to an ankle injury, then it's possible that I've stumbled across the reality here. But if I had have just looked at force, I'd be in the gym just getting my calf strong. Whereas what I really want to do is figure out now how I can optimize the ground leg technique and that in itself might overcome the asymmetry. So it wasn't the force asymmetry that was causing the problem. It was really a kinetic or a motor pattern asymmetry that just happened to be reflected in the force asymmetry. So in that case, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of looking for asymmetries. I have no problem with it. But this idea that you can just see an asymmetry, fix it, and everything will be well, I, I think is just, again, just a very simplistic approach, that one-size-fit-all approach without actually understanding the system that you're working with. So talking about one-size-fits-all approach, the 10% rule seems to have made its way in there. If it's 11, we're worried. If it's 9, we're thumbs up. Where has that come from? And should that be used anywhere? <laughs> Do you know what? I actually haven't specifically been able to see where the 10% rule came from, except for the fact that it's a really nice number and it sounds big enough, right? Look, so first of all, no, I don't believe we should be putting a 10% on anything. I see no reason why 10% would be the case. I think that in some instances, a 3% variation could be absolutely critical and highly problematic. And in another case, a 15% asymmetry might be absolutely meaningless and not affecting performance or injury at all. Again, depending on what that is truly reflecting and how important that, tr that true thing actually is. What I will say though, and again, I'm, I'm trying to sort of allay everyone, there will be people who, who in their sport with their athletes just feel like 10% was this bang on number for them. And they're so like, yeah, everyone else says 10%. I'm seeing something about this, this test I do. And when it gets to about 10%, that's also where my athletes get injured. Look, maybe that's the case. Maybe it is true that when you have enough coaches and enough sort of empirical data coming in that that says, hey, there's something about 10% in this specific sport or in this specific task, 
fine. I'm, I'm not going to say it's not. I don't have the data to not to, to disprove that. But absolutely, this idea that we can just put a single figure on asymmetry globally and it's going to be meaningful, I think that's just really simplifying things too far. One way that is uh, common and used in football or rugby or whatever as the example, one way that people are collecting asymmetry data is, is force plates and, and jumping. Is that a good way to be able to understand asymmetries? Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned cam um, 2D cameras and things like that, but is there any way that we could potentially get a more representative number of whether we need to be concerned or not? Or is jumping the best way we've got right now? It, it's certainly not the best way. It, it, but it depends on your definition of best. So let's pretend that you're an SSC coach in a, an organization where time is critical. Players have no time. They're not allowed to do extra testing because they're always just recovering from whatever they have to recover. The coaches and the medical staff are nervous about anything. W what can you do? I mean, you, you, if, you, if you believe that the jump test is telling you that maybe sometimes after some games, matches, whatever, you detect this imbalance and then you're thinking therefore that that's telling you that they've done something in the game maybe they got a bit injured and then haven't told you maybe there's some pain there that's causing it um, maybe it's just that one side of them is really fatigued for some reason they're always stepping to the right if, if that's the only information you've got then what you can do is take that to the team and say i've detected something but i don't really know what it means we should look at this further so i think that there can be some some use of these quick and ready techniques and i don't want to tell people not to do them if they believe that it's giving them some useful information but i also want to come back to this idea that there may be no imbalance in your bilateral vertical jump but then when you do the unilateral because you can have interhemispheric inhibition because the way we do a unilateral task is so different from a neurological perspective than a bilateral task you can't just do, say, a bilateral task on two force platforms and assume that that asymmetry is telling you about the true leg-to-leg -leg unilateral asymmetry and vice versa, by the way, if you're a bilateral athlete of some sort. And then we come back to the idea that there may be no force asymmetry in a vertical jump because the vertical jump might not be testing how your limb is landing on the ground as you're changing direction to the right. And if you're landing with an extended leg that's a bit far out because you're a little bit tired on that leg, during a high-speed change of direction, your ACL risk goes up. But during the two-legged vertical jump, actually, it was just a single vertical jump. You didn't detect it because it's a whole different motor pattern with a lot of hip extension and ankle extension requirement. And it wasn't then stressing how the knee had to act in a decelerated change of direction where the ACL is at risk. So actually, the vertical jump is not telling you anything about whether they're just about to go out there and, and injure an ACL. So I, I think that if you had an optimum opportunity, you would take kinematic and kinetic measurements during important tasks, and you would get the data all the time. And maybe in the future with force records, IMUs, and other things, and being able to take in-game data better, we might start to get to that point. But look, I, I don't want to... I really don't want to tell everyone that they're doing it all wrong if all they've got is a force platform, but I just want everyone to understand what they're really looking for and the limitations of, of, of that, that opportunity. So to be able to do them kind of things that you just, just mentioned there, 3D motion analysis, um, IMUs, what other tech would need to kind of be, maybe become more affordable, maybe become more usable, become more integrated mm -hmm. within professional clubs for, for team settings? What do we need to happen to be able to get to that point? Yeah, look, there'll be other people who are much better at the tech than I am, but just let's start with the 3D motion analysis. Clearly, that is cumbersome. It's big, it's hard, and, and you can pre-program all your data spit-outs, but it's, it's very rare that we do that. So that's the kind of stuff we leave for people who are coming back from ACL. The other thing that, that you could do if you've got the organization to do it is you could have some sort of, um, sort of end of pre-season when they've actually been back and training for a while you could have a single sort of testing session where you take the data and and that data might flag a major issue or it might simply be retained so that if they get injured and you're bringing them back, you've got the data to know where they're meant to come back to, right? Where you can clearly see differences post-injury. So there is a use for 3D motion analysis, but for the majority of people, it, it's not going to be around. So you can do some jump tests. You can also do high-speed 
2D motion analysis or relatively high speed with an iPhone these days, um, I would argue that you should at least put some markers on the most important joints because visually it's, it's, you know, I've seen, for example, people who, who aren't quite aware of actually where the hip joint really is. It's not where they think it is. And especially as the hip moves through its range of motion and the musculature changes, I've seen a lot of people get it wrong. So you really do have to know what you're doing. But if you could have um, some simple 2D analysis with force, that would be brilliant. I guess the new thing is going to be sort of the IMU kind of accelerometer type um, data collections. At the moment, particularly in rotation, they're nowhere near accurate enough to supersede a 3D motion analysis, for example. But on a daily basis, I mean, you could have some movements that you're doing. And if you've got constant records of athletes, then you might be able to see over time a change, or you might be able to see a rapid change within the noise of that data. And as you know, um, not only are the technologies of the IMUs improving, but we're now starting to get sort of AI or real-time measurement capacities. And they're not perfect yet, but over the next five or 10 years, they're only going to get better. And you know, I, I'd, I'd suggest you get a real techie on um, and, and really ask the, the deep questions as to where we're at now and what we can possibly do. Love it. By the way, just right. one other thing We've I thought got, of. Oh, God. If you all of a sudden yeah, give yeah. a hard session, people get sore. And, you know, if they get very specifically sore in one specific part of their body after a very hard session, that's another way to sort of have the red flag to look at why. Where's that coming from? Cool. Good addition. Good addition. Right. Third main point that we had on our list. So we had warm-ups, we had uh, asymmetries, and now we've got sprint mechanics. So I've said it a million times, but this area, the interest, especially from the team sport area, looking at the, the kind of sprint world to learn is just is just booming. So when we're looking at sprint mechanics, and I speak to I spoke to Jonas Dodu, speak to Stuart McMillan, and I'm gonna ask you, the I think I think from a personal perspective and just speaking to people, the thing that troubles coaches the most is actually trying to understand where to spend time as we discussed time can always be limited especially in football in soccer when you've got 15 minutes for a warm-up so mm -hmm. what tools do we potentially have subjective and objective to help us understand the intricacies of, of sprint mechanics within an individual and within a potentially within a team so we can then hone in a particular area i know that's a big question for you but mm. what what tools have we got available to us yeah, it is. Well, I, and, and it sounds like you guys have already talked about them quite a lot. And, and at the moment, of course, you've got your, your 2D, particularly for sprinting, the sagittal stuff where, you, you know, you can pick out joint centers or your software might do it for you and you can sort of see projection angles and joint angles. Um, let me just start by saying, of course, that with sprint running, there are some sort of global um, I, technical ideas, global sort of rules that if you're following them, you're going to run really well. Everyone is different. But there are those global rules that we don't necessarily have to talk about today. But in, in a majority of athletes who run for their sport, but they're not 100 meter athletes, what you're really looking to do is figure out whether they have got those global rules nailed down. Is their arm use effective and doing what it needs to do relative to how their legs are moving? Is their axial skeleton and pelvic region working the way it should is their hip extending and flexing the way it should because that's where so much of the work or energy of sprinting actually comes from and then is the grounded leg landing on the ground in the optimum configuration to actually transfer that energy to the ground and more importantly to use elastic elements to amplify the power because remember muscles are relatively slow right i mean you don't run through fast muscles you run through elastic energy so the idea is to see that that elastic energy storage is working well at the next level you know jonas and and and, and Stuart and others will also talk about for example the recovery leg flexion which adds a lot of work to the system and is really really important for a, a good sprinter and is maybe that sort of next level of of getting athletes really really fast even if they're team sport athletes once you got that i think a lot of that information can be well characterized or quantified by current sort of phone technologies using the apps that are available um, 
because it doesn't matter from a 2G sagittal perspective if you're a few degrees out. I would argue that you obviously want, you know, several trials to get a good idea, usually, you know, four or five trials to get a good idea. If you can get 10 footfalls, that would be ideal. Um, and of course, you're looking for changes over time. And I think, was it PJ Vazel uh, who recently put up, you know, Shelly Ann Fraser Price about 10 years ago and today, and even in her, who's a, obviously was elite 10 years ago, you could actually very clearly see the evolution of her sprint technique. So, it is true that when the technique is changing a reasonable amount, these technologies are actually really, really good at the moment. I would argue, though, that once you're getting to the higher levels of sprinters, where really running fast is important, where we're looking for small changes, where we're trying to optimize an individual based on their own body type uh, and their body characteristics, I'm not sure that the technologies at the moment are accurate enough, especially with rotations, internal, external rotations, and a few things like that. And that's where the coach's eye or the 3D motion analysis probably is even better than the, the quantifiable stuff at the moment. That's kind of where I'm sitting. And again, everyone's going to have a different opinion of that. Um, I, I, obviously, people are taking sprint times, acceleration times, and everything else. We've, we've all got that. But as far as those sorts of technologies... I think they're useful for a certain amount, if that makes sense. I think that, I that brings question? me nicely. <laughs> is, that, to the, is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it is, yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. That's that's good, mate. Then that, that kind of brings me on to the next question, which is the the, the sprint model, and again, the influence of the track coaches has made its way into the, the team sport world, and having the audience that we've got mainly in a, a team sport environment. Should they be looking to the best sprinters in the world, the the Usain Volts or whoever the the, the next up and coming uh, sprinter is, and going, I need to use that as my technical model, my sprint. I need to move my athletes towards what that looks like, or should we have an alternative model that is more appropriate for my athletes? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So there's a global understanding of how uh, most humans would uh, relatively optimally run at high speed. Um, and, you know, the way the arm has to drive from being flexed to extending out at the elbow to get a high whip toward the hip, um, the hip flexing to close-ish to 90 degrees before flying down, not letting the knee extend too far before that hip extension. There's a certain configuration of the leg that if we get it about right, we are actually able to store and release elastic energy. You know, you'll talk about, you know, a lot of people talk about front side, back side mechanics, but ultimately if the leg is coming down to the ground appropriately, appropriately producing enough force to give you propulsion and then getting off when it would no longer be effective and recovering quickly, you know, these sorts of ideas are, I think are good for every team sport athlete. And there's no doubt that, having a basic understanding of running mechanics and doing basic sprint running training is going to be good for athletes. And, and, you know, I guess in the U S not only are the fastest athletes just going to be fast, but a lot of them have done track at high school and then they go on to the NFL and they, they, they can run. Their mechanics are actually really generally very good, you know, not comparing to the elite. I guess the, the thing that differs is that first of all, there are individual differences. Second of all, you can't spend all your time doing sprint training. It's a bit like the SSC coach who wishes they could spend all the time of the athletes in the gym. That's just not going to happen. But third of all, there are some nuances. There are some differences in how someone has to run when they're on a field, changing direction and responding to patterns that are in front of them. There's no doubt that you can only change direction when your foot's on the ground. So having a long longer stride may not always be optimum because it, you can swerve at long stride, but you can't change direction effectively at long strides. We may never try to deliberately run our fastest. You know, a lot of running backs would say, I never actually try and run as fast as I can because you're so busy scanning and, and manipulating that you're not necessarily trying to run as fast as you can. Center of gravity might be slightly lower. Because remember, to change direction, you need to land with some knee flexion and push outwards. And if you're high, you literally can't do that. And there's an ACL risk there because you're going to land with a straighter leg. So the idea of keeping center of gravity is lower during acceleration and waiting for changes of direction. There are lots of reasons or lots of ways that I would argue that we manipulate the technique to reduce arm length, stride length, lower center of gravities and increase stride rates that are useful in the field sport context that we wouldn't teach a 100 meter runner. So again, maybe the answer to the question is 
globally, yes. I actually do believe that that understanding how to teach someone to run fast is useful, but then understanding then what you're actually trying to achieve on the field or the court and optimizing that motor pattern is really an important consideration. So just getting someone who can run a fast 100 meters doesn't mean they're then going to be extremely good at a sport. So you mentioned sprint drills there. And it's again, it's something that's come up multiple times in conversations with with guys that are in the trend, I hate the word, I hate the phrase, but in the trench every day with with team sport athletes trying to get them fast or sprinters trying to get them fast. And the, the, it was interesting because when I sent this over to you the, about the overuse of sprint drills, you corrected me and not corrected me, but added additional points saying potential poor use of sprint drills. And it was a couple of years ago, and my only reference is social media and what I, what I'm seeing and the the things that I'm people that I'm speaking to. It just boomed, like using sprint drills and maybe just my perception, but an expectation that this was going to be the the kind of golden bullet that was going to get mm-hmm. you know nine second hundred meter runners out of these out of these guys and girls, but. Do you see that as well in terms of a, the the part the, the, the could be potentially poor use of of sprint drills and a lack of understanding of what the actual end goal is for these particular drills? Yeah, yeah and 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 you know, so my opinion, my current um, you know belief system where I am at the moment is again, if we think about trying to 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 learn a very very complicated movement, it is very useful to break it down into smaller components and make sure that the brain understands where the body is in space, then start to move it faster, then start to add on more and more components until we learn a complex activity. In sprinting, which is a very complex sport, we might argue that what we call sprint drills are meant to do that. And I personally have had a lot of success in taking chronically injured athletes and not only improving mobility and, and, and balance and a few other things, but but taking them back to basic sprint running drills because what they're then learning is where their body is in 3D space and their body and, 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 and getting the, the nervous system to be able to control this hugely complex environment to move in a pattern that is much more optimum for performance and also for reducing the risk of injury. And so, you know, if, you know, people, if we just take something like a, a knee lift drill, why do a knee lift? Notice I never call it the high knee lift drill. And that comes down to the cue that if you, someone's trying to do the highest knee lift, they tend to lean back, you know, their toes are pointed. I mean, what's the point? There is no, I can't understand a reason for that kind of drill. And that's where we see it. We see people doing drills, but not actually understanding what they're trying to achieve with the drill. Whereas if you're trying to achieve, where's my head sitting? Is my intra-abdominal pressure, is my diaphragm slightly activated to create that intra-abdominal pressure? Is my, are my shoulders slightly down and my scapulae slightly set so that I've actually got rigidity through here so that when my arm drives, the energy, the internal energy can then get to the same side recovery leg because ultimately this arm is, is driving, partly driving your recovery leg, right? And it can't do it if, if, if it loses the, if, um, the energy on the way through. When I do my knee lift, is my knee coming where I want it? And is and is my pelvis, you know, riding up to lift the leg, or am I able to hold the pelvis in the right position and independently flex? And then even when my leg gets on the ground, is it landing right in the ball of my foot where I like it to land? And is my knee very, very slightly flexed on knee landing, or am I reaching for the ground with a pointed toe? You know, that's think of how many things I just said just then, and that's a single knee lift drill where you can be trying to find in space where you are optimally. And there are lots of drills, some of the common drills I, I never use, to be honest, because I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure what I'm trying to learn from it. But if you've got a set of drills where you know exactly what you're trying to get the human to achieve, and then you build them up into a run, and then if you notice that there's an issue, you might come back and work on another drill and then go back into the run and see if that motor pattern has helped. That's where I think those drills are very, very useful. And if you do them for, particularly from a young age and for years, you, your, your body knows exactly where you are in space and that, that movement pattern becomes really, really important. And I'll just, I'll just remind you here because there'll be, obviously there'll be obviously people saying, yeah, but the other thing about doing drills is you have to stay very internal. You always think about where you are. When you're on the field, you can't do that. I completely agree. And that's the whole point is, right, is you, if every warm up and every off season, every preseason, if in, you know, we do it with our youth development squads, you know, from young ages, 
once it becomes naturalized, you don't think so much anymore. And that's the other benefit to warm up is if you've just optimized it now, your brain doesn't have to think. It's the, it's the optimum motor pattern you've just practiced. Then you can actually focus on the field and the, the tackling and the, the ball and the, the motor, the patterns that you're trying to achieve external to you. And your body should follow a more optimum motor pattern. So I, I am a big fan of appropriate drills done with specific rationale in the lead up to proper complex running change of direction skills perfect well tony i'm, I'm so glad that i persevered with adding those three things so that the warm-up the asymmetries and the sprint mechanics i'm sure we could have dived into a little bit more from my perspective asked you a few more questions and dive a little bit deeper into each of those but i'm so glad we covered the three because there's so much great information there for for those out there that are listening so thank you very much but we're coming close to an hour if anyone wants to get in contact with you or see some of your work in these three areas or or any of the the work that you've done where's the best place well, the best place is usually by email because I don't tend to check a lot of my socials, to be honest. So you can email me a.blazevich at ecu, edu, au. Um, I think there is a few, there are a few videos floating around the ether that you might find or a, or a few research papers that you might find on Google Scholar. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. There's more than a few, Tony. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll get some sleep sometime soon, hey? <laughs> not yeah. with two kids <laughs> no that's right yeah i mean oh actually by the way feel free to put me on twitter i said socials are bad and that's because i've got kids and i i uh i can't skive off anymore and do socials but all right feel free to to contact me on twitter as well because actually you're right even emailing these days is getting too difficult with a couple of kids <laughs> No, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for lining it up. Thank you for getting me into your busy schedule and uh, look forward to keeping in touch. My absolute pleasure. Sorry it has taken so long and uh, sorry we couldn't delve into some of these things more deeply, but I really appreciate the chat and I hope some people found it useful. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Tony.